Hello, everyone. I think we're live. Yeah, we're live. Hello, everyone. We're live. I see zero people in here. <laughs> so that's a good sign. Um, hello, we're here to discuss the guest lecture. I'm going to give this a Oh, six people. Okay. We have people. All right. Um, my brain's not working well today. It feels like I'm a little tired. So bear with me, everyone, as I move through this. Um, so yeah, as I said, we're here to, to discuss the guest lecture, February's book club pick for Reading the Room book club. I wanted to start by first saying, CJ, thank you for joining me today as my co-host for this discussion. Um, and also I wanted to give a quick plug for next month's book club, which is for The Shards. I have both covers here. I'm halfway through it. I'm loving it. And I also wanted to give a quick uh, update on the book club. I'm going to have a separate video up tomorrow about this, but I'm going to be moving the book club to Patreon and like Zoom in the future. So full details to come soon, but it'll be on Zoom so I can have more, you know, collaboration with viewers and it'll be fun and easier to notify people about the book club. And so it'll be more like official in that regard. So full deets to come, but let's get into the guest lecture now. So first, CJ, what did you think of the guest lecture? I also want to caveat this entire discussion with my brain is also not working. Very fun, very cool. Um, I read this book kind of haphazardly before I was going to sleep over the course of like two weeks. Is that the best ideal reading experience for this kind of brainy, thinky book? No, it's not. So all of everything I say with a grain of salt that it's user error, not the book's error for the most part. Um, overall, I think this book was interesting. It's obviously playing with a different kind of narrative voice and structure than I think a lot of other contemporary novels are doing right now. I think it hits on a lot of the things that we like discussing, autofiction, academia, DWMs, unreliable narrators. There's a lot of different literary tropes and thematic relevant things happening within this book, but I think those form editions made it feel fresh to us and interesting. A lot of it seemed a little inside baseball of like academia, um, and I think that was maybe the most draining part for me as a reader, uh, but overall I liked it. I don't really have anything explicitly negative or positive to say about it it was good <laughs> yeah i mean for people anyone i don't know if anyone's watching that hasn't read the book um but basically it follows a woman the night before she's giving a lecture on economics and she's thinking about what she's going to say during that lecture but it becomes this very like meta thinky story about reflecting on her past thinking about how to present this speech um and it's a, it's a weird little book and I would also say, like, I also read this before bed for the most part, and I would argue it's probably a good way to read this book because she's also, you know, 3 a.m. reflecting on things, and I don't know. So it can go both ways, I guess. But, um, yeah, I thought this book was excellent. I think it's a really tough book club book, though, because not a lot happens, you know what I mean? And it's a lot of ideas presented in, in this framework. But I think, I think we can do it. I have some interesting questions here. So I wanted to start just with the framework that I just mentioned, like, did you like this style of it being set in her, in her head completely moving through like her house in her head? Like what, what did you like that at all? Definitely. That didn't feel, I guess that revolutionary to me though. I feel like we read a lot of books that you are kind of situated in a character's brain, maybe not so much in a confined timeline though this this had a very short like temporal experience and you you get the sense that the night is just like kind of building and dreading for this character and I like what you said about um that maybe that is a good way to read it because you're, you're right like I I was kind of like falling asleep with this character who was like battling sleeplessness and I think that is kind of a really interesting juxtaposition of reading experience and what's going on in the narrative um what did you think about that and like being in Abby's head. Did you enjoy it? I, that was like my favorite part about this book, which is how it was structured. And it read like a stream of consciousness style book that is similar to some others that I've read, like The Life of the Mind by Christine Smallwood, The Novelist by Jordan Castro, Check Out 19 by Claire Louise Bennett. Like it's all similar things, but like having a woman in bed next to her husband and daughter and like 
truly just sitting there. Like it was such an interesting framework and the way that he was able to make it not confusing <laughs> through the structure of using the loci method when she's going through each room in her house to give certain parts of the speech. It's it's really interesting how he how he structured it that way, but I, I liked it. And I wanted to ask you about that method though. Like, did you ever use that growing up to study for anything? No, I remember hearing of it vaguely, but reading this book was really like my first time being introduced to it more in earnest. Do you want to like maybe describe quickly what that is for people who don't know? Yeah, so basically um, I used it in relation to speech and debate to prepare for like speeches. So what you do is either like studying for a test or preparing for a speech, you study for each part or different subjects in a different place in your house so that when you're taking the test or doing the speech, you can recall where you were when you were preparing it. And then it helps you memorize things basically, or learn things. And I found it to be quite effective actually um, <laughs> when studying. And yeah, as I said, it just gives an interesting structure and like progression because when, when you move to a new room in the house, you know, it's going to be like a different subject sort of, but there's also some tangents that she goes on. Um, and I mean, aside from that being the structure, there's another character in this book who is, Keynes, um, who, who I think is really interesting here because I was not familiar with him. He's an economist. Um, and I had no idea like about what, who he was. I mean, were you familiar with him at all? No, not at all. And I think that's like one of the, I'm like, am I stupid for not knowing who this economist is? But, and like, that's like the inside baseball of academia. I'm like, maybe not. I'm not an economy major. Like, I, I don't know how commonplace he is with the general public who like aren't in that world. Um, but no, I didn't know who he was either. Yeah. I mean, I think he's really, he's really funny in this book. I mean, he's really a figment of her imagination. It's just like her entirely in her head, like creating who she thinks Keynes would be and what he would say to her, um, given her speech being about his arguments in a 1930s essay that she's giving, um, which I thought was really interesting. And I mean, one thing that I was noodling on in pre preparation for this is the tone of his argument and some of the discourse around this book. I read some pieces about it and it seems like in that discussion, he's viewed as someone who was very optimistic about the future um, during the time when he was writing about economics. And I wanted to ask you, CJ, like what you thought about him as a character and then also about his ideas generally. And if you liked his presence in the book. As a character, I liked him as a balance to Abby. I think he like was a mirror when she needed it and kind of the point of levity in the book, like you said, of just pointing out the absurdity of spiraling thoughts um, and kind of the world and the problems that she finds herself in. Um, I think it was an interesting commentary on kind of like, I guess like more white collar problems, you know, more like um, affluent problems that people are faced with um, that are a little bit more intellectualized. Um, and about his theory, I'm going to be honest. Do I have an understanding of what Keane's theory was with that original essay? No. Like, was it basically, is this a good summation? Was it basically the economy is going to have an upturn. So people are finally going to be able to turn inwards and think about more esoteric philosophical concerns rather than basic human survival. I think that's exactly spot on. That's, that's what I understood okay. it to be anyways. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think that is interesting in the fact that that's what Abby is grappling with, obviously, with not being able to get tenure. Um, and I also think it's just not true for like the most, most of the world, right? And that's kind of the crux of the book is that people are so stress still about meeting their basic needs and trying to figure out and move through the world on a day-to-day -day basis. But Abby isn't one of those people, I would argue. Um, her problems are more on that other end of the spectrum, like I said before. So I think, I think it was interesting. It was layered and there's a few things going on here about like what, what it means, like economic disparity as you move through different class strata yeah. I think that's what I want to say. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, totally. I mean, it, it was really interesting because I, I brought that question up because I saw many like blurbs and pieces that I read about it to say that the book sort of transfigures his optimistic view of the future into a form of optimism in this novel and how Abby's thinking about these things, despite those things not holding true for her, as you're saying, CJ. But there's a mm -hmm. quote from the book that I thought was interesting. Um, and it's in a Keynesian utopian alternate dimension. What would you do with your time while robots are taking care of your housework? Would you use your time differently, better? Would you consume fewer products or more? Would you become a better person or just a sprawled out version of the same? Which I think is a really interesting quote that I pulled. I don't know where that's from in the book, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, did you view this book as being one that is optimistic? Because I found... At, at once I did, but I also, I didn't. Um, and I don't know if you agree or disagree. I have both I opinions. It, so. <laughs> I don't think it felt overtly optimistic in tone. I think like it felt more acceptance, I guess. And maybe um, like, like, again, you're with her in her spiraling thoughts and kind of uh, catastrophizing the the like what ifs of this situation of not being able to get to this next milestone in her professional career and I think like the the kind of like acceptance journey and maybe mellowing out of the what if at the end is maybe what people are saying is hopeful but still felt kind of sad to me tinged in sadness but maybe she maybe it was more acceptance of things were out of her control that's like the biggest takeaway I got mm hmm yeah, I mean, I wonder if anyone, you know, viewing this, if you want to give your thoughts first, like if you like the book, let, let us know in the chat. And then also if you thought this is, as being optimistic or not, I'd love to get your your takes on that. Um, I mean, I also think, whoa, I saw a bunch of comments at one time. Hello. <laughs> so yeah, that kind of brings me to my next question, I guess, in terms of the author of this book, who is Martin Riker. And he is, I think, the co-founder, I believe, or the founder of Dorothy Project, which is a very feminist press, which I love. They published one of my favorite books last year, A Horse at Night by Mina Kane. And I thought it was interesting how Martin Riker is embodying a woman's voice in this book. Um, he is a man. And just wondered, CJ, what you thought about that from like a feminist lens, what this book is doing on that front. Well, um, to be the voice for all women in the world everywhere, um, I think it was good. <laughs> um, I also was just watching an interview with him too prior to this, and I think his wife is an economist. Is that right? So we have some auto fiction going on here, and I know he pulled from his own personal home to make this loci method work. Like the details are actually from his personal home, which I think is interesting. So... I like that he's pulling from source material close to home. I'm sure it was a collaborative effort, like a lot of domestic sharing of a life is with a partner on being able to pull these details from, you know, someone as close to him as his wife. But yeah, it felt like realized and a humanistic portrait of a person at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to catch up on some of these comments too. Um, someone, or Ryan, he also asked about that question. So I'm glad that was also top of mind. Um, <laughs> Alex said, Abby would love lucky girl syndrome. That's funny. Um, and then Nathan's also here. Hello. Um, Nathan just finished Jenny O'Dell saving time. That looks at the same questions, which I really want to read her work. I think I'm going to really like it. Um, I think her new book comes out soon, but yeah, that was that really interesting auto fictional thing going on. Yeah. Saving time is a new one. And I think her first one was how to do nothing. Yeah. That one's pretty popular a couple years back. Um, yeah, so where do I want to go next here? So, yeah, I guess the next thing I have is that that jumped out to me when I was reading it was about narrative voice and how Abby mentions that she is drawn to Keynes, particularly in how he writes and crafts his arguments in his voice, which then comes through in her mental conception of him, how her imagination kind of renders him there in terms of being a, kind of like the funny, humorous sort of entity in her mind. Um, and about how, what does it say here? Um, 
I, I copied too big of a quote. <laughs> so I'm trying to like not read like two paragraphs for you. Um, so she basically said his voice, his astuteness and humor, his crabbiness, the life in his voice, his way of seeing and thinking about the world that was not just in the ideas or claims or arguments, but in the way the voice thought, the way the thoughts turned. And then there's a quote from Susan Sontag that says, every style is a means of insisting on something. And I thought it was interesting how, even though maybe his ideas don't hold up, how she's still giving the speech about him and trying to render his voice through her own speech. And I, I wanted to just ask you about like what you thought about those ideas on, like as a reader being drawn to a voice in the way a style of something is written. Um, I don't know if you, if you have any thoughts on that. I think it, like the most, the, the the biggest thing that stands out to me out of like what you just said is humanism, I guess, and how humanism relates to optimism, which is linked to his theory, right? Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can be optimistic without being humanistic. And that seems like what she was drawn to from, from his voice outside of all of the other camp of economic theorists at the time is the personalization and I guess like more fleshed out rendering of who he was and how that was impactful. Um, mm -hmm. Which I think gets back to your earlier question of like the power of narrative voice and how that can shine through even in more academic and less novelistic applications, right? Like that's what she clung to is how he rendered, how he represented his ideas, which is interesting. Yeah. And, and that also, I just thought of this too, like it, it ties to her denial of tenure because she ended up writing this essay about him that ended up doing kind of well. And then from what I recall, she kind of stepped away from more academic like style of writing and tried to lean into more kind of like narrative driven writing about these ideas. And then, then she was denied tenure and how that is then impacting how she's sitting there reflecting on all these things. And then we're reading a novel version of it. You know, it's yeah. like an interesting kind of meta story going on. Um, Oh, here's an interesting comment. Matthew says, oh, Keynes, my bad. Keynes, man. <laughs> in its purest, simplest form is not so much an economic theory as a spirit of radical optimism unjustified by most human history. Get this optimism is so vital. That's interesting. A spirit that propels us to go on living in face of unavoidable suffering. In the end, we are all dead, but in the end, anything is possible. Yeah, yeah so I, mean, I wonder if it's like the philosophical uh, opposite to like Nietzsche you know, where it's life has mm -hmm. no meaning and it's intrinsically meaningless is, again, this this thing that goes back to humanism and optimism and unbridled uh, sense of our ability to succeed and even want to protect generations ahead of us that haven't been born. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I really don't understand Keynes but I wish I did. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Totally. I mean, it, it was an interesting framework to put it in a novel to, for readers that might not know anything about him. Like I kind of through Abby kind of understood it's sort of what he was getting at. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of going to that too. I mean, this book is reflecting on climate change and family. And I think one, um, one aspect that really stuck out to me near the end of the book, I believe is when she's thinking about like, her giving the speech, her purpose as a mother and what she's doing sitting in, in the bed with her husband and daughter and like trying not to wake them, even though she's restless herself. And she's thinking about how she's this entire time, like moved through her own brain as a mom preparing for the speech, but she never got up to leave the hotel room because she didn't like, she didn't want to wake them up. And she also was trying to prepare as well. But this idea of like her selflessness as a mother and trying to, at the end of the day, just try to do something good for her family, whether that's something small, whether it's let them have sleep, you know, or mm -hmm. something more large, I guess. So it was an interesting dynamic that I thought was presented. Um, kind of going to like that is, hope that I think is trying to be instilled, but. Is this a structures novel? I don't really understand that either. I don't, I would, I think. Hmm. That's a, a really good question. I, I don't know if, I think it's also called like a systems novel. Is that what you're referring systems. to? Too? That's what I meant. Systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if a systems novel technically needs to, 
what am I trying to say? I don't know if a systems novel can be within like the interior mind of a woman or if it has to like replicate systems on the page, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I would love to know if anyone has thoughts on that in the comments too. Um, cause it is commenting on systems though, like very <laughs> directly and broadly. So maybe yeah. it is. Can I read something from page 147? I feel like an official author please do. saying, can I please read? Um, this is such a good summation of this book to me and the problems that Keynes and Abby are dealing with the entire time. I, ideology is a big bubble that surrounds you. It's all the assumptions you make about how to live and you live so deeply inside these assumptions that it's very difficult on a day-to-day -day basis to remember which parts of your reality are natural and inevitable versus which parts are things people just made up. History is made out of realities, but come to us through stories. All the narratives we tell ourselves about who we are and what we care about. All the narratives people have told themselves about themselves for centuries. These are ideology, the plots we live inside of. Ideology isn't a bad thing. We have to live inside something, but failure to recognize ideology for what it is, to bear in mind that society and culture are things we made up and can remake and improve, keep us from changing those aspects of our lives that could be better. And I feel like that was kind of her struggle with academia and not meeting tenure is her resentment towards the ideologies, those, that committee and that group of men who didn't respect kind of like where she was or her involvement with her students was all about the ide ideologies that they held about what a tenured professor should look like. Um, I don't know. I just really liked that passage. And I don't even know if it was Kane saying that. I kind of lost track sometimes. I think he's always in quotations, right? Throughout the book. Maybe that was from Abby's monologue, but I thought it was interesting. Yeah, I think so. And it's kind of interesting too, because they're kind of one and the same, at least in the context of this book. But yeah. yeah. Um, or I think maybe she does quote him directly, but no, that is really interesting. I mean, that quote goes to something that I feel like I myself as a booktuber and a podcaster can't shut up about is like how we narrativize reality um, and thinking about how, how much stories we tell ourselves, tell ourselves about ourselves informs the way that each individual person understands their reality. And I feel like Abby is very much through this narrative while it's very like, I don't know, stream of consciousness and all over the place in terms of where she's going. Like, it's interesting seeing it in a novel form how that's being told. And I think Martin Riker does a really good job at kind of distilling that idea in a very like literal <laughs> way that I haven't read before in fiction. It was, it was really cool, but. So what do we think of some of the like um, tangential characters in this book? Like the high school boyfriend, we have the lady economics professor who she loved. Did any of them stick out to you throughout this book? So that's, this is not a criticism of the book by any means. Um, Ryan mentioned how the novels form, tra novels form transformed in part three, which I'll talk about next perhaps. Um, but one thing that I messaged CJ about after I read this book like three weeks ago, and I feel like those side characters didn't stay with me, not that they needed to really, but like, I don't really remember too many of them. Um, just because this book is so like stream of consciousness, I think that's why that happened. But what about you? Did any stick out to you? I liked the <laughs> Nathan. I liked the um, so true king. I liked the high school boyfriend, and I I liked them as as plotting points to understand where she got in her career and like how arbitrary this career path even was to her. Like that was the funniest part to me was just like being able to see the evolution of her career and how it was all happenstance, and she's just like kind of realizing that too. Um, mm. but yeah, I guess overall it, it did feel a little like side questy it, when we're like going back in deep memory and in conflict with what the rest of this book is doing. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing I, I noted too. And I think Ryan was touching on this in terms of how it strips form, but like the book starts with that loci method of her moving through the, the house, but then as the further she gets along in the night I think one thing that's really cool is how she might be drifting more into sleep than she realizes in terms of how the the form starts to break itself and then also she goes on different tangents so it kind of feels like you're falling asleep and thinking about like a million things at once I kind of loved how that was literally portrayed on the page um mm -hmm. and then also just even how it's like visually presented um for example for viewers 
how it kind of breaks down there. Always fun to see. Um, and what was I saying about that? Don't remember. Um, yeah, I guess I just loved how that was represented and how the further along the narrative went, like how much she was reflecting on her personal life rather than Keynes's. It kind of went away from the more like economic reflections to more personal things for her, which I thought was really smart to kind of give the novel like, plot progression and make you care more about Abby rather than just give people like a regurgitation of Keen Keynes uh, ideology. But I wanted to also ask you if you what you think is going to happen after the novel when she gives a speech like do you think it's going to go well or do you think her sleeplessness is going to make it not go well i'm like trying to remember where we even end this book she's still thinking and in sleep right i think so yeah the last and line like is i'm thinking so many things <laughs> And Kane's in this like last spiral is giving her speech for her, which I also don't know what that means. I'd love to talk to you about that. But as far as yeah. how this speech in reality goes, I don't know if it even matters, which is like a cop out for me to say. But I also think the point of the book is like she's she's resigning to control over this thing that she thought she had control over, like all of her calculated inputs of being able being able to measure up to like this next goal have failed and there's no rhyme or reason for that um that are within her immediate understanding of i guess her ideology um so yeah i mean i hope it goes okay for her but i also think she's kind of at this like mid list academic conference in the first place and it's really not that serious mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's so true. And I think I sent you something earlier and I can't find it, of course. Um, but it's something about how, like, I think she's reflecting on this in the book, but how her thinking about this in the middle of the night, like, it seems like it's this, in the way that the novel is presented, it's like this huge, like, reckoning with everything in her life, like accounting for mm -hmm. herself, her her past and what, why she is where she is now. But really, as you're saying, like, it doesn't, she's just giving a lecture. It's 2 a.m. and she's just thinking about her life which so many of us do that on a very frequent basis and it, I thought it was just a kind of a cool way of thinking how a novel can contain even like the most mundane moment of a character's life and like what is so right for like creation there in terms of writing a novel I thought that was so cool and like this that's why this book sticks out so, so much in my mind is like I've never read something that can take something so mundane and make it like explode in this form which is really cool um but i relate to this book a lot because like for podcast preparation every time like the night before i kind of panic about it <laughs> so like it's a, and i can't control it you know and it's just kind of what we do but yeah totally i think it's just like yeah Keynes was a philosopher disguised as an economist right like i think that's kind of his vibe like he's more concerned with the human condition and not the material effects of the economy, which mm -hmm. I think like that, that is, where am I going with that? <laughs> that was a side thought to something else I was about to say about like, yes, that small mundanity of that one moment can like trigger this hyper fixation of spiraling through your life. And I think that is what humanity is maybe. Like it's us uh, not seeing the tree through the forest and then like going back inward ourselves and trying to gain perspective because we're we're such like little simple-minded monkey creatures you know yeah that that's that is tea and like i think that's why abby's so you know trying to distance herself from academia because like really like i don't know something i've been thinking about is like how much does academia really push things for the individual you know what i mean like it doesn't really apply like me reading about theory like okay but like what does that mean when i'm up at, late at night thinking about the stuff so yeah I, and everyone in the comments agrees with you too <laughs> it's just chad said agree with cj i took the ending as her finally letting go and trying to find that radical optimism instead of catastrophizing totes matthew said yes measuring and these purely technical economic tools are not what interests keens keynes the key in there is messing me up um there are things that cannot be measured and then Alex says, I think that's what intrigues Abby too, trying to humanize Kane's legacy to the use of his language. Yeah, love the parts about what utopia is. Totally. 
I mean, it is interesting to think about even now, like writers that we read who, even in like the content of what I'm reading, I don't necessarily agree with what I'm reading, but I like the way that it's presented to me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, kind of in a different context, but like, I take everything back to Otessa Moshfeg, of course, but like even when I'm reading the content of her novels, which I don't agree with the characters' thoughts or behaviors, like the style with which she embodies those characters is something that sticks out to me. It's a very like micro novel reader response to that um, argument in this book. But yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, it's weird thinking about trying to humanize, humanize the fictionalized canes that Abby has conjured into her bedroom. Like, I guess it's like the public versus personal persona and how a figure can like transmute that and turn it on its head and become someone singular to you, which, you know, is why it's so hard to cancel public figures because they mean things to different people and hold different kinds of powers. That's kind of a spirally thought, but um, I think they're connected somehow. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're on something there for sure. I mean, I, I want, I want, want to go back up to my question that I had before, uh, which I meant to ask at the beginning, I should have said, uh, but do you think that this book is a DWM, a depressed woman moving novel? For listeners who don't know what this is, CJ has coined this term. I always ask her if she thinks books fit the, that category. I don't know if she is depressed. I think she is momentarily very anxious, but I don't know if her worldview is through a depressive lens. She is a high, she might be very high functioning and catfishing me, but she is a active human out in her personal life and her professional life. And I don't know if I felt those, those lifelong strings of uh, ennui, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> Ryan said depressed woman sitting and she literally does not move <laughs> in this book. So that's, that is a caveat there. Um, you know, I agree. I mean, I, I think, I think the style of it reminds me of some, but I think like The Life of the Mind by Christine Smallwood very much more in a similar style to this fits DWM. That's like the quintessential DWM in my mind, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think anxiety and depression are two different modes of operating from, and she's not depressed. I don't think Abby's depressed. Anxious woman sitting <laughs> is this one. Anxious woman laying. I like it. Laying, right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I dig it. Um, let's see. That I kind of burned through my questions very quickly. Um, does anyone in the chat have questions? CJ, do you have anything else you want to talk about before I ask a couple, like, I don't know, more chill questions about it? Um, I loved her roasting. It's not a question, but I loved her roasting her husband's, I guess, ambition. And then her feeling guilty about doing that and kind of backpedaling and realizing that maybe his ambition is just as valid as her academic ambition, but it's just at home and with his uh, family and more realized personal time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I found that train of thought really fun to, to witness. Yeah. That was, there's so much in here that I don't know, like I, I wonder if there could be like not a sequel to this book, but I would love to get more like in her, in her mind. I mean, it's a very singular point in time of this book, but, um, Oh, Chad, that's a good question. Can we explore the usage and definition of Keynes of a utopia? Matthew in the chat, I would love you to, <laughs> to <Yeah. laughs> give us a definition. Cause I, I think my understanding of it is what I think CJ said earlier was I wrote one down to put it very simply is an argument for how the world could be is what I understood a utopia to be. So when he's arguing for or about a utopia, it is the possibility of like a future world that has certain economic things that are like solved for people. So like the example that I had was a future in which people don't have to worry about like basic human, like hunger, for example, um, and what that would switch for people's, individualism i think but is that how you understood it cj yeah i think so it's like the 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 idea that collectivism is suddenly going to be on the rise if all of these material like worries are out of people's minds like suddenly we're just going to be like 
shot in the heart with this moralistic care and love of each other if there's no economy to mm -hmm. worry about. Yeah, I, th I think I think that's right. Um, again, Matthew, if you're out there, <laughs> no pressure though. Um, yeah, Matthew, do we know you? Because I love you. Have you been in a live stream yeah. before? <laughs> Were you an econ major at some point? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting that energy. I took econ in college and I really liked it. Did you take econ, CJ? No, I went to art school. So, I mean, this book, oh, I'm like, right. I don't know, babe. Like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I mean, interesting, interesting book and ideas presented here. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you, CJ, as you're the book cover queen, just a chill question. We'll wait for more. Um, what do you think of this cover? A scale I from like one to it. 10, what is the rating? I like it. I mean, it's not like, I, this blurb is illegal. Like, I guess he <laughs> did win the Pulitzer, right? So I guess that is yeah. some, some big names to cache. CJ, are you there? Am I frozen? Oh man, the joys of live streaming. <laughs> if you're all watching, can you hear me or CJ? Or none? CJ is frozen, okay. <laughs> Thanks everyone. <laughs> Oh man, the joys of live streaming. See, that's why the Zoom book club's gonna be a little bit, you know, less stressful. Um, okay, while we wait for CJ to come back, she just texted me. She lost her Wi-Fi. All right, if she comes back in a reasonable time, we'll keep going, but um... <laughs> Matthew said, Utopia is always something to head towards. Journey matters more. Interesting. I would actually like to read his stuff. And see how it was, you know, adapted into this version, I guess. Nathan, CJ free stuff at the hottest tea. I know. Are we going to get CJ's rating of the cover? Like, I need to get the rating. So just to go on what she was saying, I think Joshua Cohen's blurb is really interesting. He says, a major novel of bizarro feminism, language, love, family, and whatever the hell it means to own or make or be a property. Yeah, the idea of property in this book is interesting. Alex said, Matthew's a smart guy. Ricky said, CJ's teasing out, teasing out her view of this cover. <laughs> I will make her post on stories or ask her to. <laughs> She's trying to get back. Okay. She's back, y'all. Hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm sorry. Ultimate... I'm on... No, I'm on no worries. Now, so it might be bad, but. We're almost done anyways, but we need your review of the, the book cover. We're, we're left hanging. <laughs> oh did it cut at a dramatic time um you're talking I about joshua cohen's think... blurb yeah that's unacceptable to me but i understand for marketing uh purposes I, I would say it's a little muddy like this magenta is a little muddy in color palette i i like that we're not going full pastel on here but i think we could have it be a little bit more saturated but overall i like the composition of the novel I like how it's um, like an Escher-esque room, kind of abstracted, and the font is nice overall. So I'm not mad about it. And they have a French flap, which is lovely. Yeah, that is a perk. It's always interesting to me when like these, I don't know, buzzy lit thick book, lit thick book comes out to like straight to paperback. It's always interesting to me. Um, if anyone that works in publishing totally. knows about that, I would love to know, but I love the form. This is like that my ideal book form. French flap, floppy, love it. Anyways, not to go on a tangent, but um, I think that's all I have. CJ, do you have anything else on this book? No. <laughs> all right, did we conquer? The this book is so hard to talk about in a book club setting. I think we did a good job though. Thanks to you, CJ. Yeah, you we tried. Really pulled through. Um, all right, everyone, as I mentioned, I'm going to, I think I'm posting a YouTube video tomorrow about the book club, but next month we're reading 
the shards it is so good like my new sentimental favorite i think i might have already said that but truly like euphoria meets scream meets 80s meets gay it's long but it's delicious i'm loving it um and that'll be part of the patreon book club so it'll be a zoom you all can join like live chat with me which will be so fun and different for this instead of you know me reading out comments i think it'll be good and chad i'll round it out here chad said the shards is horny as hell and that is true <laughs> um ricky said i feel like the kid in class who didn't do the reading because i didn't but i love hearing you work out your thoughts while you unpack the very interesting ideas in this book ricky i think you would love this book and i would love to hear your thoughts on it if you ever get to it um we love you ricky. last comment here ricky's my king and then Ryan said, doing the audiobook of the Shards, and it's very engaging. I am too. So I bought two copies of this book, even when I had a proof. But audiobook's great. It's read by Brett Easton Ellis, which is really cool. And I'm loving it. So I'll talk to you all then. More pods will be coming. And then I'll catch you all in the next one. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>